would be impossible to celebrate uh, the 50 years of the department without also celebrating and noting the contribution that Ian Wan has made to the department. Ian Pyle lit, lit the torch, but he passed it to Ian. Uh, it was an embryonic department when he got that torch, and by the time he passed it on, it was fully formed in the form that it is today. So I want to just spend a little bit of time um, talking over, reminding people of the history and the work that we're still doing that can be traced back to early, early research by, by Ian. Of course, in the early days, we taught in black and white. <laughs> so the, which is, for me, it is important because you have wonderful ginger hair. So the, it's a shame that that's a black, a, black and white photograph. So he, he joined us it's actually 50 years ago, 1972, he became a uh, lecturer here. He previously studied physics at Leicester. He'd become a lecturer there in radio physics, but then joined the IBM research uh, laboratories at Hursley, where he became interested, indeed fascinated, by issues to do with what was later called software engineering. Uh, he became head of departments in 1983 and, and got a personal chair at about the same time. So where were we in computing back then, 50 years ago? There was microprocessors, it was a four-bit machine that uh, Intel just uh, produced that was available in 1971. And there's an increasing, as, as Ian Pyle says, an increasing trend to use computers to control equipment, not just to solve numerical equations or to manage large databases for commercial firms. So digital control was beginning to be used more extensively. But there was already a recognition that there was a crisis with the software side of the engineering. Increasingly, software-intensive systems were being built, increasingly in critical and indeed safety-critical systems like fly-by-wire aircraft. But software was not well engineered. It was over budget, delivered late, and rarely did what it was fully required to do. So software was in a problem at that time. But you can also look to some other activities that were going on worldwide. And I'll just draw attention to a single paper, Leo and Leyland paper in 1973, which talked about analysing real-time systems, the idea that you could build a model of the behaviour of a real-time system and predict its performance. That was a paper as an academic I really would have liked to have written. 13,000 citations is five a week for 50 years. <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. So Ian's early focus is definitely on, on software. Uh, as the department formed, he realised it was important for research as well as a teaching ethos to be at the centre of the department. His own work focused on a number of programming languages, PL1, Algol 68C, Modular, and then Ada. He got a first grant, I think, with, with Ian, Ian Pyle from the, what was EPSRC, but was then the SERC. He hadn't realised fully what it was, uh, its full definition should be. That was on real-time programming languages and involved the development of a compiler uh, for modular. But shortly afterwards, in 1980, he got the first really large grant, which was to do with writing a compiler for the newly defined Ada programming language, which was a significant language at that time glo globally. A number of people still associated with the department worked on that compiler development. It was validated in 1986, and in actual fact, it was the only compiler that were for the Ada programming language that was fully developed within the UK. So he had a focus on languages, but I note also three other grants he got at about the same time. One on X25 communication, how to get communicating between systems to be reliable. How to develop operating systems, particularly of the Unix variety, how to develop those for use in real-time systems as well as just in ordinary general computing systems. And how to analyse the behaviour of systems that had temporal requirements. Those three grants, I'll return to those later on because we can still see those themes in some of the work that the department does today. 
Also mentioned this morning was the Alvey program. He and uh, Rob Whitty, as, as well as others, of course, pressed the SERC to develop a program for computer systems to actually move the UK research bases forward in this new, new area to support real-time distributed systems, what is often called today cyber-physical systems. This was a sort of a unique idea for the SERC. It didn't just wait for grants to come in. It defined a programme that it wanted to see funded for the good of the research, of the subject, um, and indeed for the country. So it directed work into areas, sort of areas that Ian himself was passionate about and the work that was already going on at York. And it was also research that was, from the outset, a collaboration between academia, government and industry. Ian has always wanted the department to work strongly with industry to see its work put in, into practice. So, um, as I say, he saw the growth of the department to its sort of a, a level of maturity. It was for a long time only six members of staff, but eventually it's grown to, to 30. Of course, it still needs more. Where's the vice chancellor? Oh, yeah. um, but uh, you know, we, we are a sizable department today. There was an argument to be won at the university level about computer science, that it was a real academic discipline in its own right. Uh, both Ian's had to fight that, I know. Uh, I think we've won that fight. Um, he developed a research ethos, and that ethos was summed up in a sort of semi-quote of his, research should be fundamental and applic applicable. He believed that theoretical work also had application. It wasn't a contradiction. You were, it wasn't the fact you worked in one or the other. You could work, indeed, in both. That was central to his own research, but he then, as the department grew, encouraged the department to work in a variety of topics, HCI, artificial intelligence, architectures, databases. A number of areas grew to add to his own sort of systems work. It was particularly important to him and to the department to develop a very healthy PhD programme. Before John Wilmot's been, been mentioned, who actually supervised my PhD when I was here a long time ago, but at that time, John was the only one supervising PhDs. Ian changed all that. He broadened the basis and introduced a programme for PhD research. Again, a semi-quote I heard him often say, PhD students are the heart and soul of a research-focused department. While the rest of us are sat in board of studies and examiners and meetings that go on for hours and hours and hours, research is still going on it's going on uh, on the desks of the research students, and which is why a healthy department, which we are, a healthy department requires a healthy body of PhD students. And if you look at the numbers, I think almost 600 people have obtained a PhD from this department over the 50, 50 years. And I've got one of them, so I'm pleased about that. The work Ian did has been recognised in many ways. I'll just point to, uh, to three aspects of that. The REF, that uh, assessment of the research quality of the department. York has always been one of the top ten computer science departments since the very beginning of that exercise. In 1996, the department was awarded the Queen's of I Anniversary Prize for Higher and Further Education primarily because of the work the department did with industry, which Ian Wand encouraged, and John McDermott there was one who really put it into, into practice. Ian also encouraged the idea of spin-off companies, that one way that our research could have an impact was via spin-off companies, partly by research students going into industry, but partly by spin-off companies that set up to directly uh, commercialise the work that had taken place in the department. He, of course, was also interested uh, in teaching, and as Ian Pyle mentioned, it needed a uh, curriculum to be developed. 
There wasn't a computer science curriculum that you could take off the shelf. It needed to be developed. And he placed into that curriculum a systems view on what should be taught. What has been referred to a couple of times already today, from the physics to the people. To actually understand that hierarchy, because each cog in that hierarchy... Actually, can you have a cog in a hierarchy? <laughs> Each part of that hierarchy is exactly, you need to understand it. If you need to understand how systems fail and recover, what their temporal properties are, you need to stand, understand all aspects of that layering. He, he understood that from his research perspective, but also he placed it into the teaching, and I think we heard earlier about how impactful that was on the students who uh, engaged in our, in our curriculum. Uh, we moved from a three-year undergraduate course to a four-year engineering-based course as soon as that was possible. And we, in and we introduced uh, founder and course director of a couple of advanced MSCs, particularly in safety critical systems and, and in software engineering. He had a wider influence. I mentioned the Algae programme, which was really important for UK uh, computer science research at that time. But he was also a member and chaired a number of other committees in the SERC. He had influential roles in the British Computer Science Society, DTI, and the IEEE. He was a member and then chaired REF. A member, I think, in the first round of REF, chaired the second round of REF, which was called the RAE uh, at, at, that, at that time. And as an example of his work in 1990, and 94, he represented UK computer science uh, during two visits to Japan to evaluate the Japanese uh, software engineering programs, which at that time were ahead of the rest in the world. He also undertook a number of roles at the university level. He was pro vice chancellor and deputy vice chancellor, and he mainly focused in that time in the development of the medical school. He essentially put the program and the proposal for the medical school together, and that's why we have a medical school. That's why probably the health uh, of people in York is a lot better than it would otherwise be if York was not a medical school. And there's some other important things not to forget. <laughs> he was a founder member of the department's cricket team. And indeed was a fine spin bowler, I remember. He also introduced his son, who also played for <laughs> the, the department's computer side, the department's cricket team. Name PDP-11, players that play for it today have no idea why it has that name. <laughs> that was one of the first mini computers, mini computers, in which he developed the compiler for the modular on that machine. Uh, PDP-11 was the obvious name to give a computer science cricket team. But also, note at the bottom, building the development of the intellectual properties of the department, there were some fine parties in those <laughs> days. Uh, and thanks to Ian and Helen for hosting many, many of those. Lasting influence. He has many, but I just... Um, I wanted to make it slightly more personal to myself and my own area. One of the things the department has always done is worked in real-time systems, uh, cyber-physical systems, embedded systems, digital control systems. And I'm pleased to say we are we're indeed still doing that. Um, the work at York has a strong international reputation, I think it's fair to say. And Ian appointed some excellent people <laughs> into these jobs. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Its influence is extensive. So I just want to give an example of a little bit of work that has had high impact. Um, if you could consider a modern car, not a drive-by-wire drive uh, car, not something that's next year, but the sort of car you can buy uh, this year, it's essentially a whole host of computers on four wheels. Most of the value of a car is in the software, not in the hardware. Over a million and a half lines of code you'll find in the car. It's got 15 to 25 computers, ECUs they're called, linked by two, three networks. So you get a sort of a, an idea that that's really what a car is all about. 
Um, and the sort of things you need in order to put that on the road, you need to understand the communications. You need to be able to analyse the software and the communications. And you need an operating system that sits between the, heart, the processors and the application and the, all the numbers of applications that now run on cars. On all three of those activities, which was sort of work that Ian started years and years ago, all three of those activities in a modern car, wherever you buy it in the world, has been influenced by work at York. The way we analyse the communications is via analysis framework developed at York. How you analyse the software, similarly. Both of those have been developed by spin-off companies. But what I particularly focus on is the operating system. How you get efficient operating system that is a com commercially viable in the context of uh, mass production, which is what, of course, cars are. This was developed by a spin-off company, again, primarily PhD students that Ian encouraged, founded as a uh, spin-off company in 1997. That was bought by ETAS, still in York, uh, which is part of Bosch uh, in 2003. It's still in production. It produces two to three million copies of this software are produced every week. In total, you can see over 3 billion copies of this particular piece of software are being developed over the years. That's far more than the number of iPhones that have been produced by that, that company, whatever it's called. <laughs> um, this is a real impact of uh, what started as fundamental research was transferred into industrial application by PhDs, been encouraged by the department, to set up a spin-off company uh, to, to do that. So I want to finish um, by just giving some personal thanks, because I owe a lot to Ian. As a PhD student and a young member of staff, um, he was always encouraging, supportive, inspiring when you talked to him. He understood what you were trying to do and always helped. He listened good, he talked good. Um, Later on, I became a head of department, and he provided what I can only call sort of an invisible safety net. Uh, he never interfered, but he was always there. I was able to do the job, because I know if I really got it wrong, Ian would tap me on the shoulder and give me some good advice. <laughs> he was very encouraging. He's influenced an enormous number of people over the years, and we're all grateful and cherish many, cherish many shared memories. Thanks Ian, the department is your legacy. Um, I thank you, cheers. <laughs>